reminder <clears throat> as we dig into this morning um, that prayer is not a one-size-fits-all for every situation in our lives, right? There's not a single strategy or formula that is, if done correctly, will work every time. It doesn't work that way. Praying in Jesus' name is not a religious formula or merely a tagline at the end of our prayers. There is so much more encompassed in praying in the name of Jesus. I want to encourage you when we post this at some point when we're done, if you have not been here day one or day two, make sure you listen because we're building line upon line. Um, everything is working with what we've already taught. But you'll be okay if you're here this morning and you haven't been here through the rest of it. I just want to encourage you, don't just stop with this one teaching because you will miss a lot of really important things that we got deposited in us. I love the worship we've been having beforehand. Love the song today. Alexa, thank you. I just, that song to me reveals the invitation that God gives each and every one of us to be in his presence, to come, to pray. All of us can do this. He calls us to do it. And he doesn't just call specific people. The people we look at and think you've got a call to pray are people who pray. <laughs> the reason it looks that way is because they actually pray. And it's amazing how non-praying people who start to pray all of a sudden have a call to pray. You know why? Because we all have a call to pray. <laughs> He's given us this beautiful invitation to every one of us. Will you say yes? Will you say yes? And just say, God, I, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'll come. Will you teach me? And the great Holy Spirit, who is given to be our teacher, will teach us. There is no greater teacher. So I just want to encourage you in that. Our foundation scripture this week has been James 5, 13 through 18. Are any of you suffering, har suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick and the Lord will make you well. There is so much in here about prayer from all kinds of sides of the mountain. We're focusing on one, what it is to pray in the name of Jesus. And the first time we taught on this, I kind of explained a little more of that why. So you might be sit, sitting there thinking, man, there's so much more to this than what you're sharing. Yes, that's the beauty of the word. We can come back to it again and again, and there are thousands of things there that we have not even touched. But we're focusing on praying in the name of Jesus in this little series called uh, uh, effective prayer. Today, we're going to be praying, you will know the truth. Um, so remember Strong's exhaustive concordance. In this verse of scripture, in James, the phrase prayer of faith, in the name of the Lord, right? The prayer of faith prayed in the name of the Lord. We looked at the word name, which is onoma, a name, authority, cause. Figuratively, it means the manifestation or revelation of someone's character, i.e. as a distinguishing them from all others, who they are, what they exhibit, what comes out of them, how they live, their character, and the manifestation of that character, how it manifests itself. Thus, praying in the name of Christ means to pray as directed or authorized by him, bringing revelation that flows out of being in his presence. So we looked at three things from this about praying in the name of Jesus. Number one, praying with the character and manifestation of the character associated with his name. We broke it down this way. Number two, praying as authorized by him. And three, which we covered yesterday and we'll pick up here again, praying as directed by him, bringing revelation that flows out of being 
in his presence. We talked about the importance of slowing down before we pray when a situation presents itself. Pushing pause. Taking a minute to breathe. To actually get into the presence of God and talk to him about what we need to pray about. We, we called it praying before the prayer. <laughs> hearing from God, to not always just jump right in with what we know to do, pull out the trusty scriptures we always use, do it the way we've always done it, but to pause and wait in his presence. I loved when Pastor Daniel last night shared the story about when his wife was under attack and specifically during the time when they were writing the song, Healing is Here, and how the Spirit of God quickened, he even used that word, quickened two scriptures instantly to him that led to the bridge in that song. That example was exactly what we were talking about yesterday, what we've been talking about the last three days. When the Spirit of God quickens something to our spirit by his dynamic living voice. So uh, Pastor Daniel mentioned those were favorite scriptures of him. And in the moment of need, in the moment of nearing to, needing to be inspired by him, the Spirit of God pulls out those two scriptures, quickens them, makes them alive for the application in this situation, for the bridge of a song to be sung by all of us in declaration of faith, singing faith, like we pray a prayer of faith, singing the prayer and declaration of faith that came by a quickened word by the Spirit of God. And it carries power. Wouldn't you agree? As we sang it last night, it carries power. It lifts our soul. It encourages us. It gives us hope. Reminds us of who God is, reminds us of the authority that we have over these things that try to attack our lives. Once we, keep, we hear that living, quickened word of God, we can't unhear it. Have you never noticed that? You can't unlearn it. When God quickens a revelation to your heart, you can't unlearn it. It's, it's there. It is a part of you. Because it is the life of God that gets quickened on the inside of you. It births in us a knowing, a confidence, faith, the answer or direction we need. It is the moment of revelation that flows out of being in his presence. It's such a vital and powerful thing in our lives. This is a part of praying in the name of Jesus. And there isn't a time requirement of being in his presence to receive that quickening or that revelation. It can happen anywhere from an instant to an any other increment of time. For Pastor Daniel in that situation, the word quickened to him was instantaneous. Don't we love that? Sometimes, uh, like the, the story I shared about my need to hear him with the teaching yesterday, it came over days. Can I just encourage you? Don't stop because you don't get the instantaneous. Press in. This is where the word talks about keep seeking, keep asking. You'll get it. It will be unlocked. You'll see it. God is faithful. He will not fail. Sometimes it unfolds folds in steps over a period of time. Uh, I remember distinctly many, 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 probably, well, I won't say that. A lot of times in my life, um, these things have come in increments, in steps. And so um, two of those that I'll share with you real quick, number one was when our son was born. Uh, he was born, you guys probably all know this just real quick, he was born with a condition called gastrocesis. All of his intestines, 16 feet of his intestines and his spleen, I believe, were on the outside of his belly. Um, so somehow when his skin formed, it formed on this side of all his intestines instead of here. 
And so all of his intestines were exposed inside the womb to everything inside the womb. And so when um, I delivered him, when they broke my water, my water was green and his intestines were exposed to all of that. And so the doctors were uh, real encouraging. Uh, you know, he's going to die. And if he lives, so much of his intestines are probably going to have to be cut out that his body won't be able to function properly. It was not a good report. I was 19. He was 20. We'd been saved maybe a year and a half. Thank God we had, when we got saved, come right into the word that taught God is able, nothing is impossible with God, um, that our faith can move mountains. And so, um, so we started praying. And he was rushed off. We lived in Warren at the time. He was rushed off an hour away to Akron Children's Hospital. Um, Pastor Mike went with him. I stayed all by myself, all alone in the hospital um, while everybody ran to be where they needed to be. And so I'm, I'm sitting in my room, overwhelmed, and just began to cry, just weeping. Felt, felt hopeless in that moment. I don't know that I've had this happen many other times in the 46 years that I've been walking with him, that day, the gift of the Spirit, this, 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 a spirit of faith dropped on me in that room. And I couldn't help but believe and know he was going to be okay. So I had been crying. I called my mom. She didn't know what to do with me. So she called the pastor at the church we were going to. I think he was afraid to deal with it, so he sent the youth pastor. And so I'm waiting in the process of this. I'm crying. I'm struggling. I'm, and, and in the process of this, when I talk to my mom, I'm like a mess. Hang up the phone. She's working on getting someone to actually come and pray with me. In the meantime, the spirit of faith drops, and I start laughing uncontrollably. If you were outside the room, you would have thought I was hysterically crying. I just had an overwhelming joy, a knowing that he was going to be okay. At the same time, he's at the hospital. The doctor's talking to him about what the surgery is going to be like and what's going to happen, and, and these things are not good. And he has a moment where he's angry, confused, questioning, goes in the bathroom, closes the door, cries out to God and said, my mom had seven boys. She didn't know you. She wasn't living for you. She wasn't walking with you. Not one of them was born with anything wrong. And here we are giving our lives to you, serving you, living for you. And this happens to my son. Guess what? We're human. And so he's in there talking with the Lord and comes out and the doctor says to him, I'll give you a minute uh, with your son before we take him in surgery if you want. And he said, yeah, I want. So he goes in and, the, and Michael's in an incubator on all kinds of stuff. He's four pounds, 11 ounces. He's born six weeks early. He's just this tiny little, we could put his head in the palm of our hand and his feet wouldn't touch the crook of my arm. And so he goes in and, and, he, and he leans down, connecting with God, crying out to God, and feels unctioned in that moment, quickened by the Spirit of God in that moment to blow air, to breathe through the little hole in the incubator at Michael's face, to breathe the life and the breath of God. And he spoke over him, you will live and not die. So at the same time, the spirit of faith is coming on me. He's over there with the spirit of God quickening him in this moment. And so Michael goes into surgery, and the doctor comes out. Originally, the plan 
was to build a, a casing around his intestines and because he's so tiny and every day, he said, we have a process every day of stretching the muscle in the skin, giving it time to grow. He was six weeks premature, so it's, it's not even grown to full, full birth. So give it time to grow. And we'll keep doing that and doing that and doing that. And over about a nine-month period of time, we'll, we expect to be able to sew him up at that point. So he's going to be in the hospital through this whole process. That's the plan. So the doctor gets into surgery, and he had, he had said to him, I believe, bef- I don't remember if it was before you did the incubator or before he went into surgery, but he said to him, if you know the man upstairs, you should pray you're going to need divine intervention. And he was at that point, he was like, we got it. And so the doctor went in. He comes back out, and he said, I don't know why I did this. While I was in the surgery, I just, I just thought, I'm going to attempt to just get him closed up. I believe the Spirit of God quickened that Jewish doctor who, to, the, to what we know, didn't personally know God, He gave no indication of that to us. But I believe the Spirit of God quickened. Steps are happening. See that? Now, wouldn't we have just loved to be able to just slap the intestines back in? Like the Spirit of God just, come on, Michael, slap everything back in, and doctors walk back in the room, and they go, what happened? Right? Yes. But I'm okay with things happening in steps as long as they happen. (laughs) It's okay. The end goal is life, not death, right? All right, so, so things are happening incrementally. So he comes out and he said, so I attempted it. He said, so he, we got it all in there, and he's sewn up. And he said, I felt like his only chance of survival was to do this right now. His attitude was kind of, he's going to die anyway. So his best chance is let's just get this done sewed up so that we can keep infection away, bacteria away. And he said, and I I did it. I got him close. He had a, a small piece, like a meshing, that was under the skin where they closed it that kind of attached the muscle and stuff underneath that held him together. And then the skin over it, So he's got a scar like this. He has no belly button. Um, And so they got him closed up. And here's what he said. He said, now, the first time he cries, he's going to split that wide open. He said, he's like, getting him closed was like two pieces of frayed material. You know, you can have material that starts to fray. Or have you seen like fringe on the end of it? So them sewing him up was like sewing up fringe. And he said, the first time he cries, he's going to split that wide open. And we said, okay, we know what to pray. So we agreed in prayer. Father, we pray Michael does not cry until this is solid enough that that won't split. Do you know that little baby? Newborn baby did not cry. He didn't cry. So two days later, we're there, and the doctor comes in. We said, what's next? What's the next milestone? What needs to happen? And he said, well, the next thing is, is we have to know his intestines are working. And he said, so we're, we're going to start giving him something so that we can see if the intestines can process that. And we said, Okay, so, so what does that look like? And they, he said, well, and I hope I'm getting in this right order. He said, well, what we'd like to do is, is feed him. Um, and I, I had been pumping my milk. He said, bring it. He said, that's what we'll give him. We need give us the first few bags of it. We need to get him your colostrum. Let's get that in him. That will be very healthy for him. And so we brought little bottles with the milk. 
and sat with his tiny little baby and gave him drops, drops of milk. And he said, here's what we expect. We expect him to reject it. He'll probably be vomiting that out. And we said, okay, so we need to pray that he doesn't reject it. And he's like, okay. And so that's what we did. Never rejected it, not even once. So the doctor comes in the next day. We said, what's next? <laughs> and by this point, he's like, something's happening here. And he goes, okay. He said, now we got to make sure his intestines are working and he passes. He's got, we got to have, we got to see him have bowel movements and all of that. We're like, okay, got it. So that's what we start praying. And so like just a couple days later, he has his first bowel movement. We're like, tell the doctor, tell the, because we got to know what's next. Tell the doctor. And so at that point, he's like, well, we're seeing everything we need to see. We're, we're on, we're on, we're doing very well. And so at some point they moved him out of, out of the ICU, NICU, and into a, a, a little step down from that. And, you know, we're looking at originally nine to 10 months of this process. And so we're up back and forth every day, praying over him, speaking in tongues over him, doing everything we know to do. We're not getting any more orders of the, Lord, of the doctor of what to pray for. Everything's going well. So we just keep praying out the mysteries and secrets. And a day short of three weeks, I go up with my mom to visit and spend the day up there. And the doctor comes in and he had been circumcised that day or the day before, one of the two, it was either the day before or that day, he had been circumcised. And so the doctor comes in and he goes, you know, how you doing? I said, good, good. He said, he's doing great. I said, I know, I know. He said, you want to take him home? I said, oh, I want to take him home. He said, no, I mean, you want to take him home? I said, take him home, like, take him home now? He said, take him home now. He said, there's nothing more we can do for him here. He's good. He just needs to keep growing, keep doing what he's doing. You can take just as good care of him at home as he is here. Let's get him out of the hospital. Get him out of this environment. He'll sleep better at home. He'll... I'm like, I have nothing. I, I mean, I have no car seat. I have no, I have nothing. My sisters are at home throwing together our crib and setting up our nursery and making sure all the clothes are washed before we get home. And we took him home a day short of three weeks. So sometimes the quickening of the Lord comes in increments. Another great testimony. So we had a baby who was born here at the church and ended up with some brain damage. And so he's, he's just, a, 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 I'm trying to remember, he's weeks old, months old, like maybe two months old is sticking in my head. And he's got brain damage. And they're telling him, he's, he, he's, he's brain, we think he's brain dead and that he's not coming back. There's a great chance he's, he's going to die. And so I went up to the hospital, sat with the family, um, pray, we just prayed. We had a 24-hour prayer vigil in that room. Never was there a moment where one of us was not in there praying. I sat down with the family brought them scriptures, instructed them in how to, how to pray. Let's pray through this. And so, um, so we felt, I felt inspired to, to do that same thing. Let's find out from the doctors, what's the most important thing right now? I mean, he's got to live. So what's the most important thing? And they said, well, his, he's got, his respiratory has got to work. He was on a breathing machine. He wasn't breathing on his own. He said, we have to get him breathing on, on his own. His respiration has to work. And we're like, okay, that's where we start. And so we started that uh, with the family. That's what we started praying. Sure enough, within a couple days, they're going, we, think we're, we keep turning this thing down. It appears that he's starting to breathe on his own, which means there's some life there. Um, but he's, and this is what they said, but, but he's, even if he lives, he's going to be a vegetable. I think they were like trying to talk the family into just, just, just stop, let this go, which I can appreciate. I'm not, 
but that's where it was. It was like, so then there's that fear that kind of grips you of, man, you know, if, if he lives, he's going to be a vegetable, this little tiny baby. What is, what is all that about? And so then there was just a quickening uh, by the Spirit of God again, knowing he who began a good work here will be faithful to complete it. So we said to the doctors, okay, okay, we got gotcha. you. What would be next? Oh, let's just imagine what would be next in order for him to live. And he'd go, well, here's what would have to happen next. So we begin praying 24 hours around the clock. Sure enough, that started to happen. Pretty soon he's off the ventilator. He said, they tell us this is going to have to happen. Okay. We prayed through multiple steps for that little baby, quickened by the spirit with every step, not quickened about the, the step to come, quickened about the step right now in this moment. Do you know there was something about that that wasn't overwhelming? It wasn't too big. And at first there was like a, ble a believing for everything. And it felt like we got to pray about this and we got to pray about that and we got to cover this and we got to cover. And this just brought it down to all faith, this thing. It's so beautiful, the wisdom of God. Well, got to the point where that little boy lived. He was never supposed to walk. He was never supposed to talk. Same things with he will never digest food. That little boy absolutely walks. He's not a little boy anymore. Gosh, he's probably 14 by now, I would imagine. They moved away. So, uh, But he's, he walks, he talks, he lives, he, he is alive, he, he functions. He's left with a, with a couple insufficiencies um, just with that connection with his, with his brain. But, but I'm telling you, as a parent, we're, we're, I mean, I'm not saying as me as a parent with him, but as them as parents and as we would be with parents, we're like, thank you, Jesus. So things can happen. Things can be quickened in you in his presence in increments. Isn't that beautiful? So don't give up. Keep pressing in. Um, okay, so here's the point. In the moment his word is quickened to us, that's when faith comes. The act of faith, the prayer of faith, the working of faith begins right there. Now we can begin to do things in the flesh and say we're praying in faith, but I just want you to check that. I just want you to check it. Sometimes that's true, right? Like, like with Pastor Daniel, what he shared, those scriptures that were quickened in that instant were the right scriptures and brought instantaneous results. So yes, often that's the case. Often it's just us kicking into what we know to do. And then when doubt kicks in, we're not really standing in faith and we start to waver. But when we have a quickened word from the Lord, you can't let go of it. You cannot let go of it. And so it's important. Look at Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Guess what? That word, word, is the word rhema that we talked about yesterday. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the dynamic living voice of God, the quickened spoken word to our spirit man. Faith comes by hearing. Now, we know this to be true. I said it yesterday. I'm going to say it again real quick. You know in your own personal life, you can hear the word preached and faith does not come. You just hear it. You, you might believe it and go, I believe that. It's something you receive, but, there, but it doesn't change you. Have you experienced the difference when something gets ignited in you about it? And you're like, 
I see that. And again, I'm going to say it. Once we see something, we can't unsee it. But when we, when we believe something because God said it, which is what we need to do, I just want to encourage us not to just stay there. But people talk about, I, I don't know what to pray about. I don't know whatever. How about taking a scripture that you know and believe and praying it? Father, could you, could you enlighten me to this truth? Could you quicken this word to me? Could you make it alive in a really real way? Because when we experience the quickened word of God in our lives, we grow and it changes us and it changes how we utilize that word of God, right? I just want to challenge you with that. So the word there is rhema. It is the dynamic living voice. Now listen, dynamic does not mean loud. I'm quickened by the dynamic voice of God. I know I heard him. No, it's not that. It can be a very still, small voice. It can be a light bulb going off. It can be seeing. That is the dynamic living voice of God. Because it is the living word of Almighty God revealed to your spiritual ears. When you only hear the word of the God with your natural ears, you receive natural knowledge, which is good, and we need it. We need to know what God says. We need to know those things. But there is, there is a deeper place of that being quickened to the ears of our spirit man that changes everything. People hear the word of God all the time and it falls on deaf spiritual ears and produces nothing. It happens to us as well. It's the difference between scripture we've read a thousand times and loved and believed and cherished, but this time we read it or hear it and it comes alive to us and in us. Brother Hagen always said, faith begins... Faith begins where the will or the word of God is known. That's where it begins. Faith comes by hearing the rhema word of God. The prayers of faith we pray begin with the rhema word of God. It is the word that is known to us, not mentally, not mere knowledge, known to our spirit man. John 8, 32 says this, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. This word know in the Greek is the word gnosko. Uh, you Greek people in here, it's probably said completely different, um, but that's the way I'm going to say it. It's, it's gnosko. It's come to know, recognize, perceive. Truth defined in this verse is not merely truth as just spoken. It's truth of idea, reality, sincerity, truth in moral sphere, the moral sphere, divine truth revealed to man. That's what Jesus was saying. You will know, you will recognize, perceive the divine truth revealed to you. So eight John 8, 32 could read like this. You will come to know, recognize, perceive the divine truth revealed to you and the divine truth revealed to you will set you free. The biggest part of this is on God. Because I just want you to all go, ah. The biggest part of this, guys, is on God. Our part is to get into his presence and ask him and talk to him. <laughs> Here's my part. My part, tomorrow morning, because that's my time when I get with the Lord, wherever yours comes. My part is to go, God, here I come. 
into your presence. I'm coming to seek your face and your will, to know your truth. Father, would you turn the light bulbs on in my life? Would you spiritually enable me to see and hear and know the things I need to know so that I can be who you've called me and made me to be and do the things you've called me to do? Bear fruit that gives honor to your name. Grab hold of the promises that you've given me. Would you help me, Lord? That's my part. A child can do that, and they do. His part is to quicken a word to us, to get instruction to us, to get direction to us, to move on a doctor who doesn't even know him, quicken him by the Spirit of God. Those are the hard things. We didn't have to try anything in the natural to get through to the doctor. We just had to pray, and God did what only God can do. He speaks with a dynamic living voice and in seconds quickens it to us. Guys, this isn't hard and it is adventurous and it is fun and it's wonderful and it's full of life and it creates such great growth and you get excited to pray and a trouble comes and a challenge comes and once you get past the moment of it, you're like, here we go, God. What's this one going to look like? What's the answer? What's the pathway? What's the direction? What do you got here? It's beautiful. And it'll change your prayer life. Notice 2 Corinthians 4, 6. And I'm going to say this again. It is his part to quicken a word, give us instruction, give us direction. He speaks with dynamic living voice and in seconds quickens it to us. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, For God who said, light shined out of darkness. Okay, stop. Because this is amazing. The Bible is connecting the creator of the universe and how he said, light be and light was. How he spoke everything into existence. This God, this our, this scripture is going to connect that amazing, magnificent, mind-boggling, wonderful God, for God who said, light shine out of darkness, is the same one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. In the same way, he said, light be. He says, quicken that word. Quicken that direction. See. Hear. The same God. That's what he's doing in you when you pray and you ask. My goodness. He's got a big part to play. We have an itty bitty one. The creator of the universe who caused the light to shine when he commanded light be is the very same God who causes light or revelation to shine in our hearts. He speaks the rhema word to our spirit and we gain knowledge, understanding, insight to see what he sees and know what he knows. It is a supernatural, is as supernatural as the creation of the world. And there is nothing like it. All right, let's see the rhema word used one more time in another scripture. Ephesians 6, 17 through 18. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. In verse 17, take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God is rhema. Take the sword of the spirit. The sword of the spirit is the rhema word of God. It is the word that has been quickened to you. The word that brought Brother Hagen off of his deathbed was a quickened word. 
quickened by the Spirit of God, ended up being called to base his whole ministry on that revelation. A quickened word of God. Are you seeing this? Okay, so the sword of the Spirit is the word, it is the quickened word of God. A, a sword, when we, when we take, okay, I'm going to be careful with this. Hear what I'm saying. The word of God is powerful, sharp and powerful. So I do believe that any spoken scripture carries power. A any spoken scripture. And that sometimes speaking scripture is necessary because the power that's in it in the moment is that we're hearing it. We're hearing it. We're hearing it. And at some point, as we're praying and say, God, give me understanding. Help me see. How many times have you read a scripture where it like sparks a little, a little uh, spark? <laughs> it's, it's like not a flame. It's not like a, a fire. It's not even like a, it's not like a light. It's just a spark. It's something kind of grabs your attention. And we go, oh, that's good. And we walk away. But if we're trying to have a fire of revelation come, we fan that flame. We give attention to it. I want to encourage you, when that happens, that's God. It's like the burning bush. Pastor Dan was talking about that last night. And I'm like, go read your Bible. God doesn't speak to Moses out of the burning bush until he turns and faces the burning bush and gives it attention. He wouldn't, to, to what we know, he wouldn't have heard what God had to say if he had just glanced and went, that's weird, and walked away. Don't just glance at a glimmer of something that happens in you when you're reading the word and walk away. <laughs> Don't do that. That's the beginning of the quickening. You might sit there and say, I've never experienced a quickening of the word of God. You have all experienced a spark of the beginning of the quickening of the word of God. You just didn't know to do something with it. Now you do. Sit with that. Pull it out again tomorrow. Read it. Pray over it. Father, would you show me what I need to see from this scripture? I feel like it's, it's a burning bush trying to get my attention. I'm turning to it, saying, what do you want to say? What do you want to show me? The rhema word of God. So I believe that there is power in any scripture we speak. Absolutely. The purpose of it might be different than the sword of a rhema quickened word of God. So I have a butter knife at home. It has a little bit of a serrated edge. It's not sharp enough that, that it could hurt, but it's got a little bit of it there. The purpose of that knife is vastly different from two new knives that were just sent to us from somebody who are out, which are outrageously expensive, beautiful knives that come with red warnings multiple times all over the whole thing. Like you could lose your fingers seriously. Do you know where they are so far? They're still in the box up in the cabinet. There's a different purpose. They're both knives. There's a different purpose. And what one can do is different than what the other does. Right? And so this is saying that put on the salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the quickened, the rhema word of God. That's, okay, so while I don't want this to start to feel impossible and too big, that's what you did when you got saved. That's simple. And the Bible says, as you've received Christ, so walk in him. How did you receive him? You heard the word of God. You might have heard the gospel a hundred times before it 
got quickened in your heart. But when that quickening, all of us had a quickening that went past our ears to our spiritual ears where we said, I need this. I believe this. I want this. And it caused us to act. And when we prayed the sinner's prayer and we confessed, when we believed in our heart and we confessed out of our mouth, that was the sword of the quickened word of God. And you were saved. Again, the biggest part of this is on God. He had the job of making you a new creature. You didn't. You didn't change a thing about you. Some of you still haven't been working on that very much. Right? Can you see this, guys? Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's the rhema word. Take the sword of the Spirit. Take the dynamic living voice or Word of Christ. Pray in the name of of Jesus. This is all part of praying in his name. So much more than in Jesus' name. Amen. Right? Like, okay, so the sword of the spirit is a tool. It's a weapon. And like any tool or weapon, it lays lifeless until it is wielded by a hand. You have to pick up a sword. You have to pick up a knife. A knife doesn't cut until we pick it up and cut with it. A saw doesn't saw until we pick it up and saw with it. We are the hand as members of his body. The hand is mere flesh if it's not connected to him. You guys can throw up picture one. I love this picture. (laughs) In the movies, that glove, with all of its gems, represent the power of the universe. Mere men, okay, superhero people, whoever, cannot do what can only be done until that hand is slipped in that glove. And that's where the power lies. That man does not have to become a bit stronger. All he has to do is slip himself into the apparatus. That is us in Christ. When we pray in the name of Jesus, throw up the other one. It's the same thing, kind of. But I actually cried when I saw that because I thought, the youngest, it doesn't matter who, who does it. So physically, a young child can wield the sword of the spirit. Spiritually, a newborn babe can wield the sword of the Spirit. It's it's about just recognizing we are part of his body. So think of praying in the name of Jesus and the name of Christ as us slipping ourselves into Christ, operating, picking up that sword of being in him, his character, his authority, his power. If I try to do it in the flesh with just this hand, it accomplishes nothing. But my hand in him, connected to him, connected to that quickened word of God, and all power is available. A hand slipped into the glove, praying in the name of Jesus, directed by him, bringing revelation that flows out of being in his presence is spirit and life. I'm going to leave you with one last really quick story. You might have heard this before. It's okay. Brother Hagen delivered me from repetition. 
from the fear of repetition. Same stories again and again and again. These are powerful. There's life in them. Okay, so when our daughter was, I was trying to remember how old. She had to be five or six because she was in school. Um, and she could not yet read um, to, to vast degrees, little little bit. And so she went to school, and they started doing the tornado drills, you know, scaring the kids half to death, all of those wonderful things they do to keep our kids safe. Um, and so it affected her. She got really scared about storms. And so um, it started with when, when a storm would come, a thunderstorm with lightning and thunder would come. You could see, as a lot of kids are, a, a lot of fear there. You should want to be right near us and want to feel protected by us and typical normal stuff kids can do. But then something happened. We noticed that she started to act that way when there was like a dark cloud in the sky. So it wouldn't even be raining. There wouldn't be thunder or lightning, but there'd be a dark cloud in the sky and she'd run back in the house and would be afraid to go outside and we'd be like, what's the matter? She'd be like, there's, there's a storm, there's a storm. And we'd say, no, honey, there's not a storm. We'd try to help her understand. And then it got to the point where she'd go out with a beautiful clear blue sky, not a white cloud or a cloud anywhere, and she'd come running back in after a couple of minutes and go, I, I don't want to be outside. I don't, want, I don't want to be outside. And all of a sudden, this fear gripped her. And so we started doing what we know to do. We're praying over her. We're speaking the word over her. We're, we're doing everything we know to do, counseling her through it, you know, as a little girl, at her level, just doing everything we know to do. And it keeps getting worse and worse and worse. We would go outside because we had to go get in the car to go to church. And she would be like this on my leg. We could feel the fear. It was was devastating as parents. We're, We're supposed to help our kids. And she was a mess. And so I remember, I remember saying to Pastor Mike, we were pastoring this church at the time. And I remember saying to him, people come to us all the time for biblical advice. We're going through this. We're experiencing this situation. What do we do? We share the word with them and we pray with them. We give them godly wisdom. And we, I'm like, who do we go to? (laughs) Like We're both going, I don't know what else to do with this. Who do we go to? And it was like I heard the Spirit of God say, hello. I'm like, okay. So we started praying, saying, God, help. You have an answer for everything. You have a way of escape in all things. What are we missing? What are we missing? What do we need to do? Because she's tormented. Torment. This cannot keep happening. What do we do? And so we just spent some time praying, asking, just kept knocking, just kept knocking, just kept knocking. The Bible talks about that woman who won't stop. And the judge finally goes, okay, that was us. Okay, God, help us. We're not seeing something. We're not what? And he instructed us just in here, had this quickened moment. Sometimes it feels like an idea that comes out of nowhere, but it's not just an idea. When it comes, it comes with like this, again, I'll go back to Elizabeth when, when John jumped in her womb. It's an idea that kind of goes, and you go, oh. and so the Spirit of God directed us. She had this little tiny Bible that we, at the time, the church gave them to the kids when they got saved. So she had this little tiny personal Bible. And we took that Bible and we put it in her hands. We said, Stephanie, we've been praying for you. And we feel like the Lord said that this is going to break in your life when you start speaking to it and praying 
And she's like, okay. So, so here's your Bible. And we opened her Bible, and we read scripture to her. Psalm 91. Psalm 91 was the one that stuck with her. We read scripture to her, and we read that one over. We'd open her Bible. We would read it to her. In a couple of days, we're going somewhere in the car, and I, I hear a little rustling of paper. And I, I look back. She's got a little Bible. And she pulled it out. I don't know where she opened it into. There's no way she knew where Psalm 91 was. Or maybe we had it marked. I don't know. We hear her little voice speaking Psalm 91. She was in fear in the moment in the car. We hear her little voice speaking the word of God, commanding that fear to go, saying, no, 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 no. God's got me. She's just speaking Psalm 91 to herself. We found her doing that all over the house. Every time we were outside, that little girl did it. At some point, something quickened in her spirit. And she was set free, completely set free. It wasn't our doing. It wasn't our faith. It was her working the word. She still tells that story to this day. It marked her. Marked her. What, are, what opportunities have we missed to be marked by? Because we maybe just didn't press in. Some things you can just quit on. You know, yeah, my back hurts, but I'm just tired of, I'm tired of doing this. It's okay. I'm fine. I can live like this. I want new hope to be sparked in you. Pick it back up again. Pick it back up again. And get with the Lord in his presence. Just ask him. If you're living with it anyway, day by day, why not day by day take it to him and just say, God, can you open my eyes? I know it's your will to heal me. What am I missing? Would you show me? Would you instruct me? Would you give me some direction, some instruction? And God will be faithful. I don't know when. I don't know how. Maybe it'll be instantaneously. Maybe it'll be a process. Maybe it'll be a step-by-step. -step. I don't know. But I know God is faithful. And the only way we never know where we land is if we quit. It's the only way. I tell people all the time when they're going through a hard time, whatever you do, I don't care whatever else you do, whatever you do, do not sit down in the middle of this dark tunnel. That is the worst thing you can do. Keep going. Just keep going. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the beautiful truth of your word. You know what? These last three days, God, you've been quickening things in us left and right. People are sitting in this place who are like, yeah, I'm not sure I've ever had that quickened, who will look back at this teaching and go, oh, yeah, I, that quickened in me. That was like life in me. That was like an aha moment. That's it. Those are the light bulbs that go off. That's the revelation that comes. Help us to feed it. Help us to water it. Help us to bring it back to you and unfold it more and more and more. And whatever light you bring to it, God, here's the thing about you. Usually it's just light of looking at that from one side of the mountain. If we keep coming back, you shine a light again from over here and a light again from over here. And we can never exhaust what you know. We can never exhaust the revelation of what you see. There's never an end to it. It just keeps coming. And I truly believe that when you said, ask and keep on asking, knock, keep on knocking, seek and keep on seeking and you will find and it will be opened and it will be given to you. This is what you're referring to. Don't get satisfied with a little glimmer of light. 
Don't get satisfied with just staying where you are because what you've done so far didn't work. Keep on. Because that's where the miracles happen and the growth happens, the change happens. The beauty of who you are is manifest in our lives. Seal these things in us, Father. I pray that the things that I've shared the last three days, because I'm human, some things can get mixed in it that isn't really you. It's the wood, hay, and stubble. It's maybe a, a good thought I have or a, an idea I have or even example I shared. Father, I pray that you would burn up the wood, hay, and stubble in all of us that was not of you, that it just burn up and go away and that it not have an impact in anybody's heart in any hindering way but that the gold, silver, and precious stone that came from you by your spirit, by your word, in each individual heart, that it will remain and go deep and take root and grow and grow and grow into a tree of life that will produce fruit that they can experience in their life. Pray that, that it doesn't end here. In your name, amen.